So welcome everyone for our next seminars on probability stochastic process. And today we have Daniel Takahashi. Uh, uh, now it's in uh, Federal University of Rio Grande do Norte. Welcome Daniel and uh, uh, thanks for accepting our invitation. Well, uh, great. So thank you, Alini, uh, for this invitation. And it's actually it's a great honor actually to to be talking in this seminar. I have to say that probably this was actually the first uh, probably seminar that I have ever participated in. in not not this time, uh, but this SP the SPSP <laughs> uh, <laughs> the seminars right? the, when I just started actually working with probability. So actually, it's great to come back here in this seminar series. And also, it's a, it's great pleasure actually to have so many friends actually listen to this work. And today I will be talking actually with uh, about a work that um, uh, we just finished, I think, very recently. So this is a joint work with uh, Christophe Galesco from um, Ecampi. And I will be talking about mixing rates for process with long memory. And when we talk about process with long memory, actually, we can talk about very different uh, objects. Right? So, here, when I'm talking about long memory, I'm thinking about non-Markov process. So that's the way that I'm using long memory here. Okay? And uh, when we talk about this uh, long memory process, there is a specific um, type of model that I'm interested in. So at this, and this class of model, we, I'm calling here the stochastic chains of unbounded memory. And there are a lot of other names here in the literature, right? chains of infinite order and you know, <laughs> chains of infinite connections and so on. But I'm using this name just because this is the name that we are using very recently. Right? And this is a, just a very uh, natural extension of Markov chains. Right? Probably a lot, there are a lot of specialists in the audience, but uh, maybe not everybody knows what is a stochastic chains of unbounded memory, but this is just a generalization of Markov chains. So when we think about Markov chains, well, what do you think? You think about the transition matrix. Right? So you think that you have to know the transition matrix so to study the the process. Right? And what you have to know to define like, the, the, um, the transition matrix. Right? You have to define uh, essentially a matrix of function, okay, which goes from uh, if it's in the Markov case would 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 be something that will um, will map actually the immediate past and the present to something that is in the interval zero one. Okay, and in our case, it's the same, but instead of being the immediate past, actually we include the entire the entire past. Right? So here, right? so what? It's funny that it was working actually you now. Oh, fine. <laughs> So, uh, so we have this G, which we are calling here a uh, probability kernel, which is just a function of the present and the entire past that goes to zero one. Right? And the, the important property here is that this, this G is a probability measure when you fix the past here. Okay, so you, you have the G of A and X, and X is the past. Okay, then if you sum up for all A, Okay, then you get one. Right? So this is the normalization property. So now you have uh, something that is very similar to uh, probability matrix, but you have a dependence on the entire past. The next thing that you have to define to to uh, to properly define a Markov chain is actually how you start the process. Right? So here in the Markov case, what you do is to usually you put, you fix uh, some. Um, some uh, symbol in the past, or maybe you fix some uh, probability measure in the past and you start your process. So this is, it will be exactly the same. What we will do, you, we will define a probability measure on the past, okay? So the past will be some event in the past here, so probability measure. And once we define the, how, how we will start, then we will iterate, okay, the process using the probability kernel G. Okay, so the way that we write is that the conditional probability, okay, of the process, of the value of the process be equal A given the, when the past is equal to X, this will be exactly given by the uh, probability kernel, okay? So this is actually, it's, it's, it's very actually intuitive. Right? So you start with some measure in the past and then you just run to the future using the probability kernel, okay? Some just, uh, I will just give some examples of this type of process. As I said, okay, the simplest example is a Markov chain, okay? 
okay, where in this case, okay, the G doesn't depend on the entire path, but just on the immediate path here, okay? Another interesting example, a little bit less trivial, is that if you, if you, if you pick up a function, okay, of a Markov chain, okay, that usually would be also a stochastic chain or unbounded memory. Okay, so you take, let's say that eta is the Markov chain. If you take a function, yeah, and now, now this function will define another process. Now you can ask, okay, what will be this process? And this process usually will be a stochastic chain on bond. Now you have a dependence on the entire path, okay? Another um, class of process that are really relevant are the process that are also stochastic chains on bound memory. Sorry, I didn't explain this notation. So when I say that the mu, okay, is in PG, it means that the mu is a stochastic chains on bound memory where the transition kernel is given by G. Okay, is it clear? Okay, so this uh, the other way to say we also use the terminology that the mu is compatible with G, okay? So G measures, okay, are, are just a subset of this compatible measure where actually the measure is stationary, okay? And this is actually a very relevant class of uh, measures. And, uh, and what is really interesting is that there are several approaches to study these uh, G measures. So the G measure actually is uh, it's, um, terminology that comes from uh, uh, dynamic systems, okay? And uh, and it is used to when you when you study this process from the point of view of dynamic system. Right? So, but G measures also can be studied using the uh, using ideas from uh, from uh, statistical statistical physics. Right? So essentially, what you you can you can see that actually this the what I'm calling actually the kernel. Right? can be considered, can be seen as a specification, right? But instead of the specification, for example, when you consider specification in the in the line, in the in the in the integers, right? Now you have a specification that depends only on one side, right? only on the past. Okay. So you so and then you can ask, you know, which are the the measures that have this specification and are also stationary. So you can study from from for example Gibbs measure points of view also. Right? And finally um you can you can also you can also study these measures also from the what people call the equilibrium measure so I, I won't go into detail but just to say that actually these these objects are objects that are studied from very different approach and this is probably the beauty of this kind of process right? so just to i will use the following shorthand notation for this when the when the mu is stationary Okay, I will say that the sets of the stationary compatible measure are are denoted by SG. Okay, just to uh, simplify my talk here. So I I want also to give maybe, uh, one uh, very simple example, a little bit more concrete example of uh, of stochastic chains on bounded memory. So here, let's say that the alphabet is minus one and plus one. Okay, and the psi is like is a logistic function here. Okay, then we can define, for example, the transition, the probability kind of G of AX by psi of some linear combination of the past. Okay, this is actually, it's very similar to the easy model. You can see that there is a de depend, it's some weight, yeah, and you have the product of A and the X minus J, so there is a product of two sites, okay. But obviously now the dependence is only one side. So it, you can say that's why we say that it's like a one side long man easy model. Okay? This model is also known as the logistic autoregressive model in statistics, and also it's very popular. Actually, it's very popular even in neuroscience now. And one thing that is interesting with this model is that, for example, it can exhibit phase transition. So we know that actually, depending on how you choose beta. Actually, you can have phase transition, you know? and this is actually a result by Hulse. Mm -hmm. So this is also another thing that may be interesting with this class of model is that this class of model can exhibit phase transition, right? which is quite different from the from the Markov chain, okay, in uh, in a finite alphabet, for example. Even in the finite alphabet case, you can see phase transition. And then how the question is then how can we, can we study this kind of process? Right? As I said, you know, 
One thing that is different is that now you have a dependence on the entire path. So what you can think is that maybe you want to measure how strong is the dependence on the path, right? So because if this dependence is weak, what you expect is that this process should be very similar to Markov chain, right, in some sense. But if actually the dependence is very strong, what you would expect is that probably there, there are properties that is quite different from Markov chain. Well, for instance, you could maybe have phase transition. So there should be some way to measure this dependence. And the canonical way to measure this dependence is to use what we call the continuity rate or variation. Okay. And what, what is the variation of order n okay, of g? Right? So g is the, the kernel. Okay. It's just actually the difference of G, okay, of the transition kernel, whenever you fix the first n pass term in the, in the kernel, okay? So here you have Z, that which is the pass you, you're fixing, and what you, you change is only the past, okay? The X and Y starting from n plus minus n minus one, okay? And then you sum over A and you take the soup over all, to, all possibilities, then you get what is the variation. Okay, so essentially, pretty, it's pretty much is measuring what is the worst case scenario whenever the difference starts from n, n, n minus one, minus n minus one. Okay. And the probably the most fundamental result that is related to this quantity is the following theorem by King. Right? This is a classical term which says that if the variation goes to zero, okay, and g is strictly positive then we know that there exists at least one stationary measure that is compatible with G. Okay, so it's an existence theorem. Mm -hmm. Another important theorem, a little bit more, that was proved a little bit more recently, is the following one. So now you have, we have a uniqueness theorem huh, where we know that if the variation of G, okay, it's uh, decreased a little bit faster, this is a small O, okay, small O, of n, 1 over n to the half, so it decreases a little bit faster than 1 over n to the half, then it's guaranteed that the, the number of uh, the, the number of, of stationary compatible measure as less than less or equal than 1. So obviously if you have actually this condition, right? so you have the continuity and the strict positivity, plus actually the this decay, you guarantee that you have the exact uniqueness of comp compatible stationary measure, okay? And this result, what is really interesting with this result is that this, this is pretty sharp in the following sense. Right? So Berger, Hoffman, Sidoravicius in 2005, they showed that if the variation decreases like a one over n to the half plus some delta, where delta is strictly positive, then uh, there are um, G, uh, G measures, well, there are actually uh, kernels G with more than one uh, compatible stationary measure. So essentially there is phase transition here. Okay, so essentially what it means that if it doesn't satisfy this condition, pretty much you can find an example where you have a phase transition. So in this sense, this result by Johans over the polycot is quite sharp, okay? So, so I just talked about how we measure the dependence on the past, but another thing that maybe you would like to know is how actually the, uh, the memory will lose, the memory about the past will disappear in the future, right? So when you think about, for example, convergence to the uh, to the stationary measure, for example, right? one natural question is to know, okay, how fast actually this memory disappear? Well, how, how fast like it converts to the stationary measure, okay? So how can we measure this? So one, again, another natural way to measure is to use what I'm calling here the mixing rate, right? So, and the, how we define this? So let's say that you have two measures, mu y and mu z, okay? These are compatible with g, okay? But they start essentially with uh, y and start with that. So this is a delta measure in y and this is delta measure in z, okay? So you, essentially you have two process, so two, um, two process that start, one starts with y and the other starts with z, okay? And then the mixing rate here will be just the difference between these two, okay? at every uh, n here. So the mixing rate at, of order n of g will be the difference between the, these measures or the super over all events, okay, at time n here, okay? 
This again is very, and you get, you take the uniform bound here, okay? You take the, the soup over all possible paths. So this, I think it's quite a natural way to measure the dependence, okay? And, the, and besides always being natural to try to measure uh, how fast it's convert, it's con this, kind, this type of process converts, this quantity, the mixing rate is relevant to um, to quantify or to prove some uh, results about the stochastic process. For instance, okay, we know that if the mixing rate decays like a one over n to the half plus delta, where delta is strictly positive, then we have a functional central limit theorem. Okay, so this is quite strong because you just need to check the mixing rate, okay, and then you can prove that the functional central limit theorem. Okay. The another reason that this kind of quantity is relevant is because actually this, this, the rates of the mixing rate also controls, for example, the large deviation for this kind of process. Okay. So for example, if we take the, the probability of deviation of a function, of any function in this case, because we are just considering finite alphabet, of any function of at one to the n, okay, this is just a notation to say that it's the vector starting from one and two n, okay, at the one to n, and you take the expectation of this function, yeah, and you calculate the deviation, the probability of deviation, this, this probability is bounded, so it's a large deviation, is bounded by an exponential of something that depends obviously on, on you, on the deviation, and something that depends on the norm of f, but also on a quantity delta n, which actually it's decays like a, uh, the, the sum of the first n uh, mixing rates. Right? Okay, so for instance, what's interesting is that, for, let's say that actually the mixing rate is summable. In this case, you can bound delta n for a constant, delta, okay? And then you get at the uniform bound over all n. So now you get a bound that is independent of n, right, if it's summable. In this case, you, we say that we get actually a um, concentration measure property. Right? So this is a, actually a quite strong and very general property. And we only need to check that actually this mixing rate is summable in this case, okay? So given that we now have a way to measure the dependence on the path, and now we also um, have a way to measure how the memory uh, disappears in the past, in the future. So all the obvious question is what's the relationship between the variation and the mixing rate? Huh? So this is again, it's a quite natural question. And obviously a lot of people study this kind of question for several, several processes. And specifically for this process, uh, I want to cite two uh, uh, works, one by Bresso, Fernand and Galvez in 1999 and the Polycott in 2000. And essentially, they obtained the, pretty much the same result using a very different method, right? And the result is the following. If the variation is summable, pretty much, right? so it's like a decay by one over n to the one plus delta for any positive delta, then we know that the mixing rate will decay with the same bound, okay? So essentially, it says that if you know the variation, you know how it will, um, how will be how will the mixing rate will be decay? You know? What is really nice with this result is that we can show that this is uh, tight in the point that you can find examples where actually, if the variation is exactly decay exactly like a one over n to the one plus delta, then the mixing rate will have an upper bound and lower bound that is exactly one over n to the one plus delta. So this result is tight in this in this sense. But the one maybe observation, it's not a problem because it's just observation with this result, is that obviously there is a gap, right? So because we know that the uniqueness holds up to one over n to the half, okay? So it has to be a little bit fast, okay? But this result holds only until one over n to the one plus delta. So you want to know what's happened in between, okay? So this is another. And this is the results of our work. And what we show, is that if the variation is exactly in this gap, okay, so this uh, one over n to the one plus delta over two, right, is pretty much in, in between these two, just to check, right? So if you put zero, it will be one over n to the half. If you put one, it will be one over n, okay? So then what we know is that the, the mixing rate will decay 
like a one over n to the delta prime, where the delta prime is something that is slightly smaller than delta. Okay, what we want to say here is that the mixing rate will decay a little bit, well, at least the bound a little bit slower than the one over n to the delta, okay? So because it, the delta prime is a little bit smaller. Okay, is it clear? Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. So now what I want to show is some idea of the proof and let me see. If, okay, now I can write, that's funny. <laughs> so the idea of the proof is, so the proof is based on two ingredients. Right? So the first one is like a coupling, okay, idea, obviously. So coming from the Sao Paulo school, we have always to use coupling. <laughs> so the first idea is using coupling. And the second idea is to use renewal equation. Right? So in some sense, uh, for anyone that knows the Bresso, um, Fernandes and Gauss paper, this is a quite similar idea, but we generalize a little bit, okay, the idea so that we can get actually, the, we can extend up to one over n to the half. Right? So this is the, the trick. So, and how we start? Essentially, we, we start with a, a very simple coupling, okay, in which we try to couple a process eta j here, okay, and the process omega j, where the difference between these two processes is that they start with a different uh, path, okay? One starts with y and the other starts with z, okay? And then we will construct a coupling between them, okay? Maybe everybody knows what's a coupling, but the coupling is just a joint measure, okay, of these two processes where the marginals, okay, are exactly the each, 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 each one. Right? So the marginal, the first marginal will be mu y and the second marginal mu z, okay? But we want this marginal to have, um, yeah, okay, so, and then once we constructed this marginal, what we will do is to define an auxiliary process xn here, okay? And the xn is just simple. So let's say, so I would just try to put, to, uh, to make some figure here, maybe it's easier. Okay, my my hand is not very steady, as you can see, but it's fine. <laughs> so here you see, okay, the pass here, my pass is on the right. I know that it's straight, but I like it this way, okay. And then you start here with uh, Y, and here you start with Z, okay? And then you start to construct the process using G, okay? And then what you do is that you will first define actually uh, some blocks, okay? Some so you define, for example, M1, M2, uh, M1, M2, okay? And then you will define the auxiliary process in the following way, okay? You will check using the coupling if there is a difference between, this in, between the, the symbols in this interval and the symbols in this interval, okay? So if there is no difference between this interval, you will say that this is equal to zero. Uh, otherwise, you say that is one. Okay, and the next you do the same. You do you check if, if there is uh, any mismatch between uh, the symbols in in m in the interval m two and m one for the first process and the second process. If there is difference, you say that is equal to one. Okay, that makes sense. So now you so you have this auxiliary process that is not a one to one relationship. Okay, it's it's uh, it's related to the blocks. Okay. And uh, and now we will study this process, okay? So, and the, the way that we choose this block, okay, is using, is is in a polynomial, we, we will make this block increase in a polynomial way, okay? So this block will be of the size of n to the beta, where beta is a parameter that we will choose so to optimize our um, calculations, okay? But for now, you can think that it's something that increase, okay? Okay, and then what we we, we will have to show, okay, uh, is that like you that for this process, okay, if the original process has a variation that is decays like this, one over n to the one plus delta over two, well, which is exactly what we want, then the coupling satisfies the following inequality, the probability that xn equal one, which means that there is a mismatch in a block between, in a block between uh, mn in, and m, n plus one, is smaller than some constants over n to the beta delta prime, okay? 
And here is beta is the size of the is the rates that the block increases. So it's just n beta here. Okay. So now, because k is for now for k in inside this block m n m plus one, or we can use the following we can we can use the inequality of the probability of eta k different omega k obviously is less than this event. Okay, to make sense because this is the event that there is a mismatch, so this is smaller. Then obviously we can use the same inequality. And now we interpolate. Right? So because k is inside this block, okay, n will be larger than k over one over beta minus one. Then if we include we include we include this thing here, right? what we get is that this probability will be less or equal than the sum c a constant that is slightly bigger, okay, divided by k over delta prime. And this is essentially what we do what we, this is how we get the results, okay? So obviously, I have to explain how the coupling happens, right? but you can see that actually the idea is pretty simple. You couple, you take the auxiliary process. Now you study this auxiliary process that has some interesting property. Actually, it will be a renewal. And then we we just, and then we interpolate the result and we get back the, the result that we want. Right? So that's the idea, okay? So how now, how is the, how, how we construct the coupling, okay? So the coupling, but well, obviously we start with delta measures in the past. So we start with y and z, okay? And now we construct the coupling in a recursive way. So how we do that? So let's say that by induction, so we we uh, we have a coupling between eta uh, minus infinity to, to mn minus one and omega mn minus one minus infinity. Just to remind you that this is the M, the process that has the Mesh M Y, okay. You remember this is the M Z, right? The one that starts with Y and start start with Z, okay. So and we let's say that we successfully coupled until M N minus one, okay. Now what we we will do is actually it's very natural. We will maximally couple the next block, okay. And how we maximum couple? I, I don't know again if everybody knows what maximum coupling is, but just to uh, to have an idea, the maximum coupling in our context, okay, is a is a, again is a just uh, is just is um is a coupling. First of all, maximum is a coupling such that you have the falling property, right? So the probability that is a mismatch on the block in the block m n and m n plus one minus one, okay, in this block, okay, that there is a mismatch condition on the path, okay will be the minimal among all the possible couplings, okay? So this is the definition of maximum coupling here. So we couple, if we couple the past, then we try to maximally couple the next block, okay? So this is the, the idea, okay? And why do we use the maximum coupling? The, we use the maximum because, because it's very, um, it has a, a very nice bound. We, we can calculate bounds for maximum coupling, yeah? So for example, in our case, if we take, for example, the soup, well, well, sorry, first, not consider, don't consider the, the, the soup, but let's say the, the, if you calculate the probability that there is a mismatch on the block MN, okay, so this again, MN, okay, and then MN plus one, okay, so the probability there is a mismatch in this block, given that in the, the previous K blocks, Okay, there was no mismatch. Okay, and the condition in that the all the rest uh, can be anything. Okay, so if you take the soup of over all all this type of uh, conditional probability, okay, we know that this by the maximum coupling property, this can be bounded by the the one over the infimum g. Just to remind you, the infimum g is larger than zero. Okay. Or the square root of sum of the variations of the variations for all the paths that we are not controlling. Right? So because just remind that we we know that it's zero until block n minus k, okay? But we don't know what's happening here, right? So we have to include the variation of all the things that actually it's it comes. Active from this test here that we are not controlling. So, okay. 
So, so as I said, what is really nice with the maximum coupling is that we can have this kind of bound that is based only on the square of the variation, okay? And then now we can define the following auxiliary renewal process, okay? So we will define the ZN, okay, as a process starting from zero with alphabet zero one, okay? And the one is the renewal event, okay? And then we start with Z0 equal one, okay? And then because this is a renewal process, we have the following part, the probability that the ZN equal one, given that the ZN minus one and, and N minus K is equal to zero, okay? So it was zero until, so this is the, so I don't know if everybody is following here, but then, so you have here N, N minus one, blah, 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 until zero here, okay? And sorry, until N minus K here. So it was, the probability is one here, and it was zero, 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 and the one here. Okay, so the conditional probability it was one and it was all zero up to n minus k minus one. Okay, will be equal to bk. Okay, and it doesn't depend on what comes before because the one is the renewal event here. Okay, so I'm defining the process in this way. And what is the the bk? Okay, bk would be exactly the sup of the q and k over all n here. Okay. And what is nice with this is that now we have a renewal process, a classical renewal process, right? So which, which is homogeneous actually, right? In the in which is homogeneous because the QKN depends on the on the position, and also in how much how much in the past we look. Okay, so we cannot use this directly to define the renewal. You will have to somehow to uh, to make this independent of the position, right? which is n. So therefore, we take the soup, okay? The only problem, the technical problem now is to, to make sure that this soup, okay, is not one, right? It has to be something that, that see, it's, it's not one, okay? So this is the only technical thing. And once you have this, now you use the property that there is a stochastic domination between the, origi the, the original auxiliary process and the, the new auxiliary process, right? And the why we have this, I think pretty much if you look at the definition, you see pretty much right away. It's because like the ZN, the probability to observe one in ZN is always larger than the probability to observe one in the original process, right? Just by construction here, because we are taking the soup right? over all the, the possible, all the possibilities to get one, okay? So we get this thing. And now what we have is that because we, we can dominate the original process, the original auxiliary process by this renewal process. Now this renewal process, and here is J obviously. Okay. Now we only need to, to study this renewal process. And obviously this is now become uh, much easier because we know a lot about renewal process. In particular, we know that the probability of the, this ZJ equal one, is actually smaller or less than BJ, okay? This is just a property of a renewal process in the, oh, okay. And if you remember BJ, well, it's just the soup over all QKN, okay? And the QK is bounded by this thing, okay? So if we take the soup of this quantity, what we get is that this is less or equal than exactly a constant over j to the beta and delta prime, okay? Which is exactly the result that we wanted, right? So if you go back, uh, this is exactly the result that we wanted here, remember? So we get the pxn is less or equal than c over n to the beta delta prime, and this is exactly the result that now we get here. And yeah, so I think that's it pretty much. If there is um, any question, you can just ask me. And if you want to see more details, the paper is in the archive now. Thank you so much. Thank you, Daniel. Anyone has any comments or questions? I'm gonna wait a little bit because uh, Sandra told me that sometimes I'm too fast. 
<laughs> no, say, uh, Aline, uh, like, uh, do you have a question? No? Okay, so goodbye. No. <laughs> no I, I have a, a question. I, so yes. when you, when you, if you come back to the inequality where you give the concentration inequality from the mixing rate, mm -hmm. then you can, you can use this even if you don't want that uh, to have, um, so here you can use this because you have you have a limitation for the L, ln now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you can use it to have uh, concentration inequalities uh, without some ability. I mean, this is a consequence of because I, I remember that at one point we tried to use this coupling to mm -hmm. get concentration inequalities in the setting where it was in L two. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but we did not manage to make the coupling. So now mm -hmm. with this coupling, you can get such inequality for a concentration inequality. No, no, no. because, because the, the key point here is that uh, this thing has to become, um, but I, I know what, it, so that, that, a little bit more detail, but I think the, the main point maybe that I want to make is that if you cannot control this uniform in some way, right? Uh, not you know, sorry, that's not it. So if it is not summable, which is which is the case for the for our result, right? Because uh, if it's not if the variation is not summable, the mix the mixing rate is not summable. In this case, okay, you cannot get um, something that is a concentration. You can get uh, okay now you can, you can get, get something uh, depending on n. Okay, you, you can get something that is non-Gaussian concentration. That should be um, something that it doesn't go as n, but it's not exponential of n, but it will be exponential of minus uh, n to the sum alpha, right? That's what you're saying. So that's yes, true. Yes, I understand that uh, if you want to have it like Gaussian, that is mm -hmm. the delta n will not depend on, you have a bound on delta n, which is fixed, mm -hmm. or, uh, mm -hmm. then you cannot. But the, here you still can have something depending on n, Diverging with n, probably, mm -hmm. but uh, okay. So, okay. but 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 you but you have to see that you cannot get actually a real concentration in the sense that you cannot get for uh, any function f now. Uh -huh. What you have to do, you have to compensate with here. So it's kind of it's not really a concentration. You can get a larger deviation, but not a real concentration measure. Mm -hmm. mm, okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Anyone has any other? question I have one but maybe you you told us and I, I didn't realize because actually you you have some delta prime that actually should be smaller than delta right mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I understood yeah. your, your idea of true but I don't I didn't see where you use this mm -hmm, mm -hmm. okay smaller mm -hmm. than delta. yeah I, I will show mm -hmm. so maybe just one comment first comment it's mo it's most likely that this is actually just um, how can I say an artifact of our proof, right? Because it's uh, this is a typical like a for any delta prime less than delta in reality should be delta here, right? But uh, we cannot get that with our technique. But it could be just an artifact of proof. Right? Just to this is just a comment, and then in the proof where it appears, it's here, right? So when you get actually the bound for x n. Okay, actually what we can show is that uh, um, it's a constant over n to the beta and delta prime where actually this delta prime, so actually there is actually this C is also depends on delta prime, okay? So the problem appears here, if we take the delta prime very close to delta, this thing go to infinity, you know, explode. So that's why we have to take actually delta prime that is slightly smaller than delta actually. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. No more questions or comments? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so let's thank Danielle again. Maybe turn on the microphones. Thank you, Danielle. Thank you. Thank you for